Ever wanted to know all about some of the most influential business leaders in the area? I'm gonna peel back the layers and see just what makes them tick. So welcome, Jonathan Crow. So we're, we're talking all things business today. Um, we're talking about your business, Zambrero, and, uh, and how you got there. And so tell us your story, tell us your journey. It goes back a little bit now, Trevor. Um, born and bred in Wollongong, you went to Edmund Rice College, um, Sydney University, did physiotherapy, um, ended up working in, uh, well, obviously went, ended up doing some Ironman for a little while, and then uh, ended up working with uh, John Carson and getting into construction. That took me to North Queensland where I built some marinas and then over to Dubai, which was fantastic. And then um, back into real estate and then ultimately ended up in Zambrero, which it was, a, I sort of fell into that accidentally. Um, I was living in North Queensland with my wife and we were moving back to Wollongong to look after mum. Uh, mum wasn't well and um, I had a, a job that I'd set up a, a consultancy business and my wife didn't have one and um, so we were looking for something for her to do and so we bought uh, the Wollongong Zambrero store and then as you know she moved back here and REA offered her a role and so she took that and I got left holding the burrito <laughs> basically. <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. So. so tell us the transition from it's kind of Iron Man into acting <laughs> and, then Very into, loosely. And, then, <laughs> and then into um, into business ownership so how did you transition to both? So. Oh, uh, it was it was really interesting. I had a um, you know I did physiotherapy before I actually became a professional athlete, and then lived the life for ten years of getting paid to go to the beach, which was fantastic. Um, and then getting towards the end of my career as an as an athlete, and I'm sort of you start thinking and wondering what you're going to do next. And and I was very lucky. I had that physiotherapy degree to fall back on, but. Um, so I started getting back into that, but it just didn't uh, work for me. It was, you know, it was great when I was younger and, and an, ath an athlete and wanted to get into sports medicine. But, um, you know, they just for me, there just seemed to be too many restrictions. Um, was concerned financially about whether it would work as well. And having been spending so much time at the beach, um, you know, I was being worried. I was worried about being stuck in a cubicle too. So. I actually went and knocked on the door of John Carson, who was the, the owner of the Beechwood Homes, the Illawarra Wollongong mm -hmm. Hawks, and also he was doing all the developments down on Cliff Road. And um, I, you know, I, I had a, a passion for construction and pro project management and development and, and real estate, and I asked him for a job. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, I don't know. I said, I'll make you coffee, do your photocopying. I just want to learn. Mm. And um, so he took me on, and, and that was sort of the beginning of my journey into business, um, from a professional athlete into business. And um, I've been very lucky um, in my whole life that I've had people that have been able to, I've been able to learn from, you know, the university of life and people that have mentored me and taught me lots. And, um, you know, that sort of, I worked for him for four years and then ended up working for a, um, a, a very wealthy lawyer's business in Sydney who, owned the marina up in Airlie Beach and went up there and ran that and built that for them and then um, and then ended up in Dubai and um, and then came back and sort of and then got into my own my own world my own business we bought a real estate agency in North Queensland and sold that and then here I am now running Zambrero. You could have quite easily just gone okay I'm going to go be a physio back in Wollongong and nothing you wouldn't have seen the world or, or changed anything but you took a punt and you you knocked on doors to find out different avenues. So, so tell me about something that you probably don't want to talk about, but you talk about your Baywatch days. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about left of center and skewing your career, um, how did that change things, and how did you get into it? Again, um, you know, I've been very very lucky through my whole life that I've just met some amazing people, and um, we were in South Africa at the World Championships. The manager of the American team was a really good guy. I knew a few of the guys in the American team. I became friends with the American manager. Turns out that he was in, he was the executive director of Baywatch. I didn't realize this. I went to Atlanta for the Olympics, popped back into LA on the way home from Atlanta and rang him up and said, I'm in LA. Can I catch up with you? And he said, sure. Gave me the address and I went around there and um, it was Baywatch headquarters. So um, 
and we've we've got a great friendship and and we developed a great friendship because i didn't know who he was mm. and so our friendship developed on based on the people that we were and not who we were which is not la which is not la yeah. and um you know we talk probably now once a month we send emails every now and then um you know our friendships endured 20 something years now and um yeah look i was there in la stayed in la for a couple of weeks um, they gave me a screen test. We ended up having a race there. They wrote a, um, an episode around a race against the, the Baywatch American actors. And um, yeah, they asked me if I wanted to have a go. So I did, you know, I, I, I think as, as, as you know, I've told you, I think they put me on there to make the, the actors look good. <laughs> I think I made Pamela Anderson look like an Academy Award winner. So, <laughs> so for me, that was fantastic for my, you know, my individual profile. Now I'm a little bit older and, um, you know, it's not as important to me, fame and fortune and or maybe fame, maybe not the fortune. And, you know, I look back, I don't really like talking about it a lot now. Um, I noticed. <laughs> you know, I was a terrible actor, but I, I, had a, I had a great time. It was two amazing years of my life. I lived in L.A., um, got to do some amazing things, met some amazing people and, you um, you know, it, it was a great part, and and it all came around from meeting someone in surf club. It's just, it's funny how just one introduction to someone leads you to something else, which leads you to something else too. So, let's let's fast forward um, back in Wollongong, talking about Sombrero. Um, how did that come about? You just sold your real estate agency in North Queensland. You've come back here. You've said, okay, we're going to get into something. Was um, Zambrero on the radar or what brought you to that? Uh, not really. So I, it, we knew about Zambrero because there was seven stores in Townsville. That was sort of one of the first places where it originated in Canberra. And then and then one of the guys took it to, to Townsville. And it was our weekly, it, it was our weekend junk food. Um, Natalie and I used to sneak down there every weekend and that was our go-to. Um, um, Natalie had always said, my wife had always said, oh, I'd love to own the one in Wollongong, or I'd love to have a Zambrero store in Wollongong. And I, and, and I sort of said, well, there's already a store there, so we can't do that. And it wasn't really on the radar. And we were looking for a business that was sort of ready-made that we could um, plug Natalie into. And um, so we started looking at franchises. We looked at coffee and gyms and pizzas and you name it, we looked at everything. And we were actually going, we were a long way down the track on gyms. And it just so happened I was at the Cowboys, a Cowboys football game one night, and one of the guys in Zambrero who owns about 10 stores said to me, you know, the Wollongong store's on the market. So literally at the football, I rang Natalie and said, the Wollongong store's on the market. Monday morning, we, we called head office. It was owned by head office at the time. Called head office and um, started negotiating. So it was... Um, and then one, one led to... Yeah, so... Um, Natalie was going to take over that and then, then the REA group um, offered her a role down here so, which she picked up and so I got left with the, the store. It was, it was being run under management so it was, um, you know, it was essentially being run on its own anyway. And um, sort of in the middle of negotiating that head office approached me and said to me, um, did you want to be a development agent? And, and Zambrero has a little bit of a different model than sort of the major franchises. They, there's a there's head office then there's a development agent and then there's the, the stores, the franchisees underneath. So I sit in between um, Zambrero and the franchisees and, and deal with everything at a, at a franchisee level. And so they sort of said to me, do you want to take that on and do you want to um, be a part of that? And, and we, we sort of talked around it for about six months and, um, and then picked it up. Okay. So one of the big things for me was it, it's one of the big things I learned very early on was all about passive income. And um, it, my, my business that I had at the time, my consultancy business was great. And, um, but the minute that I stopped working in it, the income stopped. So, um, you know, for me, that was one of the attractive things for Zambrero was, was the fact that it was a business that ran whether I was there or not. And, um, you know, we've got three stores now and I've got um, 18. I took it from two stores to 18. Um, and, and they're all running really, really well. Yeah. You obviously deal with people, um, employing, hiring, firing, that sort of stuff at various levels. You, you're talking to franchise owners. How do you select the right kind of person? Like, what do you look for in a person, both in a franchise level or just in an employee? At a, at a franchisee level, it's interesting. Franchising um, 
just as I was getting into Zambrero was, was massive in Australia. Um, and, and it is one of the biggest industry sectors in Australia. Um, however, that's changed and changed since I've got into the business. You know, you know we've had some major organisations and some, some large multinational companies and national companies that have done the wrong thing by franchisees and, and the, the employees as well. And so franchising has really taken a, a, a back step in terms of growth. And so we've had a lot of trouble I've had a lot of trouble growing the brand um, and, and, and getting franchisees engaged. So sometimes you can't be choosy, mm -hmm. um, but you still have to be choosy. They've got to be the right fit, the right culture. They've got to have the right attitude. For me, it's about um, why do they want to come into the brand? Why, what are they trying to get out of it? They've got to have some good business acumen. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people you find are just trying to buy jobs. And, and that's not really the right person that we need. Mm. Um, Tell me about marketing. So with any business, there's a certain element of marketing. Um, being a franchise, they take control over most of it. Is there anything that you do on a ground level for your businesses that really change things? Good question. Um, I hate marketing. <laughs> it's so fluffy and there's all, it's all colors and, you know, and throw darts at the board and hopefully one of them lands. It's interesting, when my, when my stores don't do well, um, I look at what we've got to do, or when, when we have phases where we're not doing well, we, you know, you look at your local marketing and you look at, your, at what you're doing in, the, in the, your area. I think marketing to an extent has been diluted massively thanks to social media, thanks to the various different things that are, are running around in the, in the cyber world these days. But social media in particular, I think, has diluted um, the effectiveness of all marketing, full stop. You know, if you, ha you only have to sit on the train and watch someone on their phone and watch how long they interact with something and how long they, they look at stuff on their feeds, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and it's, you know, literally doing this. So well, They're scrolling the length of the Heidel Tower every single day. Correct, so it's, um, correct. And they've got an attention span very short now. Yeah, so. yeah. So I, for me, I always go back to the basics. It's, is our customer service good? Is our food good? Does our store look good? What do we need to do? Get the basics right, and that will follow on. And, and, and pretty much every time I've seen we've had a decline in something and I've gone back to reset the basics, I think that's been the best form of marketing that yeah. we could have. And word of mouth is massive and it's underestimated mm. greatly. Personal contacts and relationships that we have within the local business community, I think are far more effective than any dollar that we can spend on, um, on marketing. So what, what sort of skill set do you think is natural and what's learned for you in a leadership sense? A lot of my skill set is natural, but that come, that's come from me being an athlete, I believe. Um, I think I, I, I'm pretty sure it's genetic that I've, I'm a high achiever. I always strive to, to, to achieve what I can improve every day, try and, you know, I set goals, I set targets, always want to succeed at what I do. Um, certainly in the sporting area, that was the case, and I believe, and I, I know I've transferred that into my business. Because you'd have to be fairly dedicated. So with your Ironman, there'd be a lot of hours in training, and you'd probably brought that into the business world. I'm Definitely, guessing. yeah. My, you know, my, my work ethic is, my work ethic. When I was racing, I wasn't the best athlete. I didn't have the best talent. You know, there was guys around me that had so much more talent than I did, and didn't train as hard as I did, and and still could beat me every day of the week. So I got to where I got from doing, from just hours and hours and you know, the guys would get off the water and I'd go and do another hour, uh, you know, and I know that I got there because of dedication and, and commitment and just doing so much more than mm. those other guys. And I, you know, my work ethic is like that now. It's transferred from when I was an athlete to into, into work, work long hours, um, expect a lot from everyone that works for me isn't the best way to manage people sometimes. Um, I've had to soften that approach a lot over the last five years. I've learned a lot, particularly dealing with the millennials, the younger generation, um, <clears throat> where they, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, they haven't had to work to get stuff. They haven't had to earn it. They haven't, you know, there's jobs sort of seem to be floating around, maybe not at the moment, but you know, there was no commitment, no loyalty, no anything because it was so easy to do elsewhere. Mm. So, you know, that's certainly been um, an approach that I've had to change or... It's, it's interesting your leadership start changes with the people that you're dealing with. Yeah, and I've, I've been really lucky that I've got some very good people around me, um, sort of in between myself and my staff. My managers are fantastic. Um, 
My manager here in Wollongong, Jess, is just amazing. And she's on the cusp of being a millennial, but she's she's got a great old head on her, I should say. And, and traditional her traditional values are great. So she and I are really aligned in terms of what we expect from our staff. And um, but I let her do all the do all the good stuff, and I you know I pay the bad boss and let her get everything out of them by them being loyal to her and um, and listening to her and, and doing what they need for her. What does success look like to you? Like, how do you define success? You, you look back, you're at retirement. What what is it that? Um, look, when you're racing, obviously it was you know winning, mm-hmm. winning or placing or, but for me it was always doing the best that I could do. In business, look for me, there's a lot of. There's a lot of KPIs there. There's a lot of markers. Obviously, financially, it's important. You've got, you've got to, we're not doing this for the fun of it, um, for, for kicks and giggles. So financially, that's, that, that's probably the biggest thing for me, financially, particularly at this stage of my life. But definitely there's, there's little things like knowing that, you know, getting feedback from someone saying they went in and they ate at your store and um, staff, sending you an email saying thanks for this and and stuff like that for me it, it's just I, I presume i think it's just a bigger package now for me mm. there's a bigger picture yeah. and in business it's always there's there's kpis you can check and in real estate there's there's how many sales you do and in winning oh, sorry in, in iron man it's how many enemy wins you get but it's it's very different when you look back on it in business and go okay what my wins how do you how do you check that and some people say how, how well I did, some people say how much money I made, some people say how, how happy I am. So for you, it's the total package, isn't it? Yeah, and, and look, it really is happy, happiness, um, how well the business is going. You know, we, we, our December month, after five years at Wollongong, our December month was the best month we ever had. And it wasn't our best month of sales. It was, um, it was a great month for sales. It wasn't our best, but cost of goods came in underneath what they've ever been now. Um, our labour costs came in. Um, our, you know, I have other KPIs there. My, you know, complaints that we received within or feedback within the store was the lowest it was ever been. So, you know, just being able to do that, and it was coming off the a, a, a twelve months where we hadn't done very well. So, you know, from about um, August September last year, we started to see some great results and some great growth. So. You know, for me, that was fantastic. And, um, and knowing that all that hard work that you're putting in is, is actually translating into results. It's a game of inches sometimes. It's a game of sense mm. for me, you know, and, and, and kilo, milli, well, grams, grams yeah. as well, because we're dealing with, when you're dealing with food um, and cost of goods, I, one of my favorite sayings to, a, um, to my staff members when they, when they get inducted and they start training is we talk, it's very hard for a, for a 16, 17 year old to understand what cost of goods mean and, mm. and percentages, because we talk about percentages and in the food world, you try and have 30% cost of goods. So if you, you, know, if you said to a staff member, it's 30%, we, we're hitting 20, 31, 32, doesn't mean anything. So I always translate it to the number of burritos that we're wasting or whatever there. But I say to them is, you know, if I said to you, is 1% wastage okay? And they, and usually they'll, They'll always say, "Yeah, that, that sounds okay." But one percent in a in a million dollar store is ten thousand mm. dollars, and so you know we, we're talking about inches, percentages, grams. Yeah. grams. What advice would you give a twenty year old Jonathan Crow, or in general, to, uh, to a twenty year old today? My yeah. advice would be get in and do the hard work. Mm. Be happy to start at the bottom. Yeah. Be happy to not earn a cent, um, and learn. Listen sit and listen and learn from smart people and follow yeah listen so if you could live anywhere in anything in in the illawarra i've got a house on the beach of port kembla and absolutely love it wouldn't so i wouldn't move we love it i love the beach that's the cleanest water on the coast happy to stay there Jono, thanks for chatting no worries thanks mate